How are we doing? It feels like a historic day, does it not? You know what today is? It is the end of sweater weather until the fall. Now, I wouldn't really clap for that. I personally enjoy sweaters. Maybe I'm truly alone in the world in that regard. But I got my sweet bird shirt, which means absolutely nothing other than the fact that my wife does my shopping for me. I would like to welcome you to week four of our series called Signs. And as we're now past the halfway point of this uh, this here series, I thought it'd be a good time to sort of remind ourselves of what the purpose of this is. So in this series, we're looking at these specific miracles that Jesus performed and John recorded in his gospel account. But according to John, these miracles are not just random displays of supernatural power. He calls them signs. Normal transition here. So this November, me, my wife, my kids, my in-laws are going to Disney World. Yeah. You know, the 9 a.m. applauded for that, and I, that really makes me feel nice. I did not anticipate anybody being that excited for me. It really feels warm and welcoming in here today. I appreciate that. The only reason we can go to Disney is because, uh, and I do mean the only, only reason, is because I have what I consider to be the greatest in-laws in the world. So I'm really excited about November, not just for my kids, but because I've actually never gone to Disney myself. Not that I'm bitter or feel like I missed out on a childhood or anything. Uh, so, so jokes aside, my dad's in the audience today, I'm not going to look at him. Don't mean to shame you, Pops. You did your best. I love Jesus because of, you know, what you've shown me. And, but I'm going to get down there in, in Disney, and I, like, I, I am, I might be that dad that, like, body checks his son out of the way so that I can give Mickey a hug, because I got some lost time to make up for. We have me and Mickey and the crew, a lot to talk about. Uh, so I haven't been to Disney myself. I have been to Florida a number of times. I've been to Orlando. And here's what I've noticed. If you've been to Florida, I'm sure you noticed the same thing. If you're in about a 100-mile radius of Disney World, you see signs everywhere for Disney World, right? But here's what you'll never see. You will never see a minivan with mom and dad and the kids out of the car, parked underneath one of the signs pointing to Disney World, standing up, gazing in awe at the sign that points to Disney World. You're never going to see people waiting in line for hours, baking in the heat of the Florida sun, just to stand next to the sign and take a picture with the sign that points to Disney World. You're never going to see somebody fly halfway across the country or halfway across the world just to be with a sign that points to Disney World. Why? Because everybody understands that those signs point to something far greater than themselves, which is actual Disney World. So nobody stops at the sign, they go to where the sign leads them. Now I say all that to say that these sign miracles of Jesus in John's gospel, according to John, function in exactly the same way. Every single one of them is meant to point to something far greater than just water becoming wine or you know, sick people becoming well. They're meant to point to Jesus. And according to John, we don't even really understand these signs until we understand what they say about Jesus. So I say all that to say this. Seven days ago, in this here sanctuary, somebody heard what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. They understand what that meant for them today, and right here, seven days ago, they gave their life to Jesus on the spot. I just, Jesus said that angels in heaven rejoice when one sinner repents. And before he went up to heaven, he told his people, the marching orders for the church, we call this the Great Commission sometimes. He said, make disciples. And a disciple is very simply just somebody who's had their life transformed by Jesus. So if you're new here trying to figure out what we're about, we exist for one reason, and that is to see lives transformed by Jesus. Everything we do, we do with that goal in mind. We've designed the whole church around that. But what I, what I thought was so neat is after that individual gave their life to Jesus, they signed up to get baptized with us on Easter. So normal segue here, let me say this. If... You got sprinkled as a baby, we will finish the job for you free of charge on Easter Sunday. And if, if you have just recently committed your life to Jesus or recommitted your life to Jesus, we would love to dunk you on Easter in front of your friends, family members, neighbors, coworkers. Get them all in here. Let's fill up these maroon chairs. And if, this is my last one, if, you are like so many people in the church, this church and the church abroad, that you've been in, in the faith for a while and you haven't been baptized for any number of reasons. I got one good reason that I think is a big enough reason to outweigh any reason you have for not getting baptized. Here it is. 
Jesus said to. And you can call me old-fashioned, but I believe that when somebody dies and comes back to life, he gets to tell us what to do, all right? (laughs) General life advice. Okay, so welcome to Severin into week four out of our series called Signs. We're going to pick it up with Jesus' fourth sign, which is found in John chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. It says this, after this, Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias, and a huge crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was performing by healing the sick. So Jesus went up a mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now, the Passover, a Jewish festival, was near. Therefore, when Jesus looked up and noticed a huge crowd coming toward him, he asked Philip, where will we buy bread so these people can eat? He asked this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered, 200 denarii worth of bread wouldn't be enough for each of them to have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Then Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, so they sat down. The men numbered about five grand. Then Jesus took the loaves, and after giving thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also with the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were full, he told his disciples... Collect the leftovers so that nothing's wasted. So they collected them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces from the five barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign he'd done, they said, this really is the prophet who was to come into the world. So the first phrase you read on the, on the front end of this story is after this. And what I want to do real quick is just recap sort of what's going on between last week's sign and this one because a lot's happened And the climate has really changed in Jesus' ministry, which really sets the stage for the significance of this story. Last week, we we looked at the story of Jesus healing the lame man at the Pool of Bethesda. I'm not going to get too far into that. That's on our website and our podcast. But what Jesus did was he told a man who'd been laying on a mat for 38 years to take up his mat and walk, and the man did. And he told him to do that on the Sabbath. Because Jesus told him to do that on the Sabbath led to this real ugly conflict with the Jewish religious leaders. And through that conflict, Jesus wound up saying some things that he had not said before during his time on earth. For instance, Jesus started referring to God openly as his father. Nobody else talked like that. He, st- he kept referring to himself as the son of God. Nobody else talked like that. He went even further and said, Jesus said that he had the power to judge and he had the power to give life, which, okay, now we're well outside of the range of what an ordinary human could say. But then Jesus said something that I've always considered to be one of his most amazing statements during his time on earth, and it's this statement that really informs the way that I preach every single sermon. In John 5, 39, Jesus said, you pour over the scriptures because you think you have eternal life in them, yet they testify about me. It's kind of like the cheat sheet for preaching. Everything in the Bible, according to Jesus, is about him. You haven't preached it well until you get to the feet of Jesus. But that's an amazing thing for Jesus to say. He was telling that to people who, in some cases as a profession, had studied the Bible their entire lives. They'd studied the Old Testament. Of course, they didn't call it that because that's all they had. It was just their scriptures. What Jesus is saying there is that that story about Abraham and Isaac in in the book of Genesis, that's not really about Abraham and Isaac. Jesus said, that's about me. The story of David and Goliath is not about a shepherd and a big bad guy. Jesus said, that's about me as well, or Jonah, or anything in the Old Testament. Now, just to kind of bring that into today, if I stood on this stage this morning and said, hey guys, I've been a little bit shy about this, but I think it's time to be forthright, the entire Bible's talking about me, Uh, hopefully you'd find a new pastor, like right then and there, because you would understand exactly what I'm saying. To claim that the Bible finds its fulfillment in you is to claim unequivocally to be God, to be far more than a man. And so I say that to say, if you're here and you've heard, well, Jesus never really claimed to be God, you've just been lied to. Specifically in John's gospel, Jesus repeatedly makes the claim that he is God in all these really uh, creative but uh, impossible to misunderstand sort of ways. But, so keep in mind, Jesus had not been that explicit yet. Now he has been. And so that kind of sets the stage for this story. John tells us that Jesus has gone across Galilee. He's got a crowd of thousands following him. 
and, um, and, he, and he sits down uh, ready to teach them like so many rabbis would. Then in verse 4, John gives us another detail that kind of sets the stage for this. In verse 4, he says, now the Passover, a Jewish festival, was near. And here's why that's important. Uh, Passover as a holiday was instituted for God's people all the way back in, in the Old Testament, back when the nation of Israel was enslaved in Egypt. The very first Passover was the day that God's people were freed from slavery. Passover in Jesus' day was a time that would really cause a lot of tension for God's people because in Jesus' day, once again, they found themselves enslaved to a foreign nation. This time it was the Roman Empire. And so just imagine this. Imagine if our country was conquered, overthrown by a foreign enemy. They're marching their soldiers up and down our streets, flying their flags in our cities, overtaxing us, trying to regulate our religious practices. And then the 4th of July comes rolling around. That's what Passover was for Jesus' people, the Jews, 2,000 years ago. And so this was a time when, when patriotism ran really high. And this was also a time when they would be painfully reminded that here they were as a people yet again enslaved to an Egypt in need of another Moses to come and liberate them. Now, I, I say all that to say just picture this scene. Jesus, up to this point in his ministry, has turned water into wine. You, you better believe news of that had traveled. He has saved an official son from the brink of death with just a word over several miles. You better believe news of that got around. He, we looked at last week, he healed a lame man who was imprisoned on his mat after 38 years, told him to pick up his mat and walk, and he did. And now this man is starting to claim to be something more than a man. He's got thousands and thousands of people at his feet on a hillside hungry for freedom with Passover just around the corner. If you were one of Jesus' disciples, you're waiting for Jesus to do something huge here. So here's what we read, verse 5. Therefore, when Jesus looked up and noticed a huge crowd coming toward him, he asked Philip, where will we buy bread so these people can eat? He asked this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. What this says about Jesus is our first idea this morning. It's number one, that Jesus came to provide for us. One of the things that I think is, is so neat about the Bible, is you, and, and I'm sure you all have, have noticed this, if you study it in, at different times, different seasons of life, um, you know, the, the Bible says that, that God's word, it's, it's living and it's active, meaning it'll speak different things to you at different times. Studying this story this week, what, what really impacted me about it is how it shows us how differently Jesus viewed people than how so many other leaders do. Because so many leaders, when they see a crowd, the very first thought in their mind is what they can get from that group. So many leaders, when they see a crowd, they, they, they think about, you know, that I can get money from these people, I can get fame and influence from these people, I can get power from these people. But Jesus here, what he's showing us is that when he saw a crowd, he didn't see a group of people he could get something from, he saw a group of people he could give something to. And, and the thing about Jesus, when you just study his life through the Gospels, and if you're here and you're not really sure what you think about Christianity, the best piece of advice I could give you is just study Jesus. The whole thing's about him. It centers around him. If you just look at Jesus' ministry, one of the things that you can't argue with is that for Jesus, people were never a means to an end. They were always the end. What you see in the Gospel accounts is that Jesus came to love people. He came to serve people. He came to reach people. By his own admission, he came to seek and to save lost people. Never as a means to an end, but as an end in and of themselves. And that's what he's showing here. That when a, when a large group of people was gathered before him, his first thought was what he can do to provide for them. But as great as that sounds to us, it did not sound like a good idea to Philip or to the rest of the disciples because Jesus hadn't kind of given them the back end on what he was planning to do. And so Philip responds to Jesus' question by saying, hey, 200 denarii wouldn't be, uh, that, that wouldn't cover enough bread to give everybody just a single bite here. 200 denarii was eight months worth of wages in Jesus' day. So this is Philip really respectfully responding to Jesus' question about where are we going to get the, this bread this is Philip saying, nowhere. We're not going to get the bread from anywhere, Jesus. Uh, you, you maybe could have mentioned something about this earlier. There's no possible way to obtain the grain, is what he's saying. But here's what, here's what, we, ha what we have in, in verse 8. Verse 8 says, One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a boy here 
who has five barley loaves and two fish, which, you know, most people know how the story ends, but I, I just think that it's kind of comical that Andrew would bring that up there because the implied idea is, let's steal it, right? <laughs> Here's a poor kid. Let's make him more poor, guys. <laughs> like, what? So he says, but what, what, what are they for so many? Verse 10, then Jesus said, and you know everybody got quiet when Jesus said this. Jesus said, have the people sit down. And I bet everybody was like, okay, <laughs> let's do that. Verse 10, there, were, there was plenty of grass in that place. Interesting side note. So they sat down. And then it says the men numbered about 5,000. Now, you've probably, one of the things that's unique about this story is that it's the only miracle recorded in all four gospel accounts. And it's always known as the, the feeding of the 5,000. But what you read there is John's telling us there wasn't 5,000 people there that day. There was 5,000 men. And if you do, do a little bit of research, pretty much every commentator, every scholar will say that there were probably about 20,000 people there on a hillside that day. Now, if you ask me, it's far more miraculous that Jesus would feed 20,000 than 5,000. So why did this miracle get labeled the way that it is? Why only count the men? Is that because only men count? Definitely not. Every detail that John gives in these stories, he gives for very specific reasons. They're there for a reason. And the reason that he tells us that there were 5,000 men specifically in the crowd that day is because 5,000 was exactly the size of a Roman legion. Jesus knew that. The disciples knew that. All the people on that hillside with him there that day knew that. So what Jesus had was not a crowd of hungry people. What he had was an army. So he fed them with this poor boy's lunch. And John goes on to tell us that everybody ate their fill to the point that they had to fill 12 baskets with leftovers. That's a really cool detail that John includes there because the vast majority of the people that were a part of that 20,000 person group with all the men, women, and children, the vast majority of them had no concept of what a leftover was. The vast majority of people who have lived and died on this planet have had no idea what a leftover is. So for a lot of the people there that day, this may very well have been the very first time in their life that they knew what it was to not be able to eat anymore and yet still see food in front of them. And what that serves to show us is the abundance of Jesus' provision. Now, the people responded to this the way that everybody responds when you feed them. They loved it. And in verse 14, here's how they responded. It says, when the people saw the sign Jesus had done, they said, this really is the prophet who was to come into the world. Now that phrase, the prophet who was to come into the world, was a reference to something spoken back in the Old Testament that God's people had been holding out hope for for thousands of years. All the way back in Moses' day, he prophesied that one day God would send a prophet like him to his people. And so the, these people, this, this group of 20,000, after having just been fed bread miraculously, they start to make this connection, realizing, wait a minute, Moses fed the nation of Israel with bread miraculously. So they start to see this connection between Jesus and Moses, and what they all knew was Moses was a liberator. Moses was the man God used to lead his people out of slavery and into freedom on the very first Passover. And so here they were on this hillside with Passover fast approaching, and all of them are expecting Jesus to do exactly the same thing, to lead them into freedom. Only this time, it would be freedom from Rome. And so they respond exactly how you would expect them to. They're ecstatic, and they try to make Jesus their king. Now, up until this point, it's obvious, you know, based on Philip and Andrew's responses, the disciples didn't have any idea why Jesus decided to do a feeding miracle. He hadn't done anything like that yet. You know, he had water to wine. He's got the, the official's uh, sick son. He's got the lame man. Up until this point, they would have had no idea why Jesus decided to feed these people. But right then and there, that's when the light was coming on for them. So they're thinking, okay, now I get it. Jesus knew that if he fed these people, they would see that he's the new Moses. They would buy into you know, his, his ministry and his mission. They unite around him. This is it. This is when the revolution happens. This is when everything begins to change. And, and just picture this scene. See, all things considered, it would have been a lot easier for Jesus to upend Rome than it would have been for Moses to upend Egypt because Jesus has something here that Moses didn't have, which is an army. So here they are on the northern edge of the Sea of Galilee with five, a small army the size of a Roman legion. You can bet that by the time they looped around Galilee and got to the southern edge, they would have picked up a number of people who were hungry for freedom along the way, easily doubling in size. 
By the time they get from Galilee, halfway to Jerusalem, momentum would have only grown. And by the time they arrived at the city of Jerusalem, this would have been a movement. The whole Jewish nation would have come alive, inspired, ready to rally behind this new Messiah, this new Moses that's going to lead them into a new era, a new freedom. But watch how the story ends. Verse 15. Therefore, when Jesus knew that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. I guarantee you the disciples... When you follow the details, it says that Jesus sent them across the Sea of Galilee and he himself withdrew privately. I guarantee you it was gut-wrenching for the disciples to see this thing break that way. Because in their eyes and in anybody's eyes, looking at, at what was going on there naturally, this was a huge missed opportunity for Jesus. What Jesus had here was an opportunity that most leaders would die for. The timing of this thing was perfect. Passover's right around the corner. People are hungry for freedom and ready to do something about it. The setting was perfect. Jesus has a small, now well-fed army. He's got 20,000 people ready to make him king on the spot. The stars have aligned. Moments like this are the kind of moments that you know people are going to look back on and say, that's when everything started to change. And Jesus walked away from it cold. And like everything that Jesus did during his time on earth, it begs the question, why? If you read this story in context, what you find is that John 6, 1 through 15 is just part one of this sign. Part one of a two-part sign. And what part one shows us is that Jesus came to provide. What part two shows us is what exactly Jesus came to provide. Because after this, Jesus meets up with his disciples on the far side of Galilee. And the people realizing that he was gone loop around Galilee, still hanging on every word Jesus had said. They catch up with him in verse 25. It says, when they found Jesus on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Verse 26, Jesus answered, I assure you, you're looking for me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. And this is Jesus dealing with something that we've seen him deal with before. There's this huge tendency for people to come to Jesus with totally wrong motives, not for who he was, but for what he could give them. And in verse 30, as they reply to Jesus, they only prove Jesus to be right. Verse 30, they say, what sign then are you going to do so that we may see and believe you, they asked, which is a kind of crazy thing to ask. When you read this in context, what are you going to perform? And then they kind of give him like a suggestion of a miracle. Verse 31, our fathers ate manna in the wilderness, just as it's written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. If you ask me, that's kind of an audacious thing to say to Jesus, considering less than 24 hours earlier, he fed 20,000 people to the point that they couldn't eat anymore with a poor boy's lunch. And here they are again, just proving what Jesus already knew to be the case, which is that they still don't get it. They still don't get who he is. They still don't get what he came to do. They still don't understand who exactly they're witnessing. So Jesus responds to them with this final discourse. And in this final discourse, he answers the question that this entire story has been asking, which is what did Jesus come to provide? Verse 32, Jesus said to them, I assure you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the real bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Verse 34, then they said, sir, give us this bread always. And in verse 35, Jesus made what would be the first of seven I am statements that no ordinary man could have said. And I just picture a dead silence in the crowd and Jesus looking out and saying these words, I am the bread of life. Jesus told them, he said, no one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. This is our second, and it's our final idea this morning. It's that Jesus came to be our provision. Let me call the teams up, and and we'll wind down today. When Jesus addressed that that crowd that day and said that anyone who comes to him and believes in him would never be hungry or thirsty again, 
What Jesus was saying is that he did not come down here to give us things that would satisfy us. He came down here to be the end of our search for satisfaction himself. And by saying that only he could satisfy us forever, what Jesus is saying is something that every single person listening to this can attest to, which is that anything we look to in this world for satisfaction will eventually leave us hungry or thirsty again. That's why some of us listening to this right now are standing in what we used to consider to be the promised land, and yet we have what we told ourselves would make us happy, would make life worth living, and we're not any better off for it. We have the job. We have the pay raise. We have the relationship or the house or the car or whatever it is, but sure enough, we're looking for something else now. The bottom line is that no matter what we look to in this life for satisfaction, be it money, be it success, be it sex, be it the respect of the people around us, whatever it is, it's always going to leave us with nothing more than a desire for more. But Jesus here is claiming to be the end of that for people. He's claiming to be an escape to that for people. He's saying that he alone can satisfy a need that every single one of us has that nothing else in this world can satisfy. And the need that Jesus claimed to be able to satisfy for you with those words is your need for eternal life. And the eternal life that Jesus says he gives to people who come to him is not something that begins the day that you die. It's something that's meant to begin on this side of eternity. The life that Jesus is talking about here is a life of love, where the love of God that's poured out on you through Jesus that Paul said nothing can separate you from transforms you and transforms the way that you interact with the people that he's placed in your life. The life that Jesus is talking about here is a life of joy, Joy that comes from knowing that there's something so great ahead of you that it's worth whatever you have to go through to get there. And it's a life of peace that can only come from knowing that every one of your sins has been paid for, that none of them will ever be charged to your account, that you will never have to wonder about being found wanting in the eyes of God and that when you stand before him at the end of your life, he's gonna welcome you into his family forever. It's a life that Jesus offers that's meant to transform us on this side of eternity. You know, some of you know this, a lot of you probably don't, but just recently we had a dear brother from this church go on to be with the Lord. His name was Dick Royer. And the word that I keep hearing people describe him as is a hero. And, and I'll tell you why. Weeks before, one of his close friends just told me this in the wake of his passing. Weeks before he went on to be with the Lord, he was with his wife around a group of their friends. And he told them that there that all of their years together, Jesus was teaching them to live together and now Jesus was teaching them how to die together. And when he was in the hospital, laying in the bed that would prove to be his deathbed, he wasn't resentful about the things he didn't get to do or the things he didn't get to say or the life he didn't get to live. And he was, certainly wasn't fearful about what was ahead of him. His final moments running this race called life were spent with his hands held high praising God. People were telling him about the people that were getting saved at our church on Sundays when he couldn't attend. And even when he couldn't speak, he was given the thumbs up because he was with us in spirit. And the only thing that he wanted was that that medical staff that was caring for him would come to know Jesus the way that he had known Jesus. And amen, amen. And when I hear, listen, when I hear about the way that he finished his race, he just strikes me as a man that looked death in the eye knowing that death had already been beaten. And the only way that that you have that kind of life, the only way that you can face death like that is if you've met the bread of life. It's a transforming life on this side of eternity that Jesus would offer everyone who's tired of what this life offers and comes to him. And everybody knew that when the Messiah came, he would transform our lives. But what nobody listening to Jesus knew that day is how he would do it. They didn't know what he meant when he said he was the bread. And I'll, I'll close with this. For Jesus to say that he was the bread of life, see, The only way that bread can feed people and satisfy people and give life to people is if it's first broken. And that is what Jesus came to do. Everybody thought when the Messiah came, he'd break his enemies. What nobody saw coming was a savior that was ready to be broken for his enemies. But that's who Jesus was. He's a Messiah that nobody, nobody saw coming. So he didn't allow those people to place a crown on his head that day because he knew the only crown he came to wear was a crown of thorns. And he didn't allow them to place him on a throne that day because he knew he came to be placed on a cross. 
And what not even his own disciples knew that day in John 6, but they would soon find out at a place called Calvary, is that the man who called himself the bread of life came to be broken so that broken people like us could be made whole in him. So we're going to end this service celebrating communion, which is a physical reminder of what Jesus taught us in John chapter 6. And if you have a relationship with Jesus, you're welcome to come take the bread and the juice as we close today. But, but man, I, I, I got to believe that there are people listening to this that are so fed up with what this world has to offer. I have got to believe that there are people listening to this that are so dissatisfied with this life. You've been looking for satisfaction down here everywhere. It hadn't left you with nothing but empty hands. C.S. Lewis said, if I find in myself desires that nothing in this world can satisfy, the only explanation is that I was made for another world and you were, and I am, and Jesus knew that. And he's promised every single one of us is that if we get tired of living that life, when we get tired of living that life and we come to him, he has the satisfaction that our souls need and can't find outside of him. And if you're ready to put your trust and start following Jesus today, we got a response team that would love to talk with you, pray with you, so that you can go out of here fed once and for all by the bread of life because he's promised that if you come to him, you're never gonna be hungry, you're never gonna be thirsty again. That's it. That's all.